Yes. Yep. All right, y'all, it's officially 10.03 in the Pacific. Uh, and, you know, I thought I'd started off with some Throwback Thursday vibes, except that's actually probably not the only relevant part of the Bad Boys uh, talk track or theme song here. Um, you know, I, I grew up uh, watching the show for better or for worse. But actually, when you think about the big picture of prompting, you should all be thinking, bad prompts, bad prompts. What you're gonna do when Anna comes for you? That's right. Sorry, terrible joke to start things off. Uh, everyone can eye roll, and uh, you know we'll, we'll move on with our lives. But if this is your first time joining a Copy AI webinar, let me just set the uh, record straight here. We're gonna be very much involved in helping you actually build out your prompting techniques and your prompting capabilities. We'll start out with a handful of pictures. We're actually going to spend the majority of our time looking at the product. And that is really our style for making sure that, you know, this is not another sales pitch. You're actually getting exactly what you join this webinar for. And the big picture here is that we want to help you do more with less. And we want you to be the best at actually leveraging our platform to be able to get what you need done that much faster. Before we dive into it, why does this matter? Why are we even qualified to talk on this topic? Who even is Copy AI, right? These are all questions that you're probably wondering, or maybe we've already answered for you in the past, but big picture, we have been at it since 2020. And frankly, there are three numbers that you need to understand why we're qualified to talk on this topic. 8 million, 28, and 36. Uh, there's probably a connection here. I've tried you know, saying that there's no connection between these numbers, but someone is gonna disprove me in the crowd. What these numbers actually represent, though, is the reason why I joined Copy AI. What they actually mean is 8 million customers in 28 months and with 36 employees. Foundationally, we all recognize that large language models are capable of doing some really incredible things. That's not up for debate in 2023. What is, is actually how we can empower you as a business user in order to get the most value out of these platforms and actually be able to do the things that you need to do in order to be able to, one, ensure that you're doing your job 20, 50, or 100% better, faster, and more effectively. Um, but bigger picture, how we can actually help get you back to what you love doing most. What we've done throughout our history and what really you know, has, has driven our growth at Copy AI is actually leveraging our own platform in order to be able to scale our business. And we've done this in a couple of different ways. Um, first, by building the tools that you need to actually get the most out of our platform. Uh, we hope everyone uh, has already checked out uh, our chat platform, but if you haven't, just throw chat.new in your browser window, and uh, you can actually follow along with us today. Um, 
That really is a representation, though, of how we actually move rightwards along the AI maturity model curve. Now, I know what you're thinking. Um, I hate it when a vendor shows me a graphic and says, hey, you know, you can move rightwards along the maturity model by buying more of our tools. Um, that's not what this is. This is not even our maturity model. It's actually partners. And what it represents is really the long-term vision from actually how we go from level one awareness to actually a transformational adoption of AI. Now, whereas a lot of platforms really focus on really, you know, empowering developers or empowering, you know, a handful of people within the organization or making sure that this is actually something that is influencing your product, um, what we think is that that actually sells toward the full promise of AI. And whereas this, you know, curve looks all neat and linear, what we actually know is that this is an extremely iterative process. It's an iterative process that every team goes through. It's an iterative process that we've gone through. It's an iterative process that you're going through um, as you adopt these tools and actually leverage them to get your work done. In order to help you with all the ad hoc tasks, all the things that really, you know, are probably killing your day to day, we've actually built out chat. And if you haven't gotten a chance to try it, I encourage everyone to do so. You can create a free account at Copy AI. Um, but what chat lets you do is solve a lot of the day-to-day -day problems that you might face in a, you know, really uh, part of your, um, uh, as a part of your day-to-day. -day. It helps you figure out how to do the things that you need to get done faster and ultimately allows you to have a sidekick to help you produce content and really do whatever it is that's a part of your role um, that much faster. That's great, right? Who doesn't want to be 20, 50, or 100% better at their job? But that's actually not the promise of AI. The bigger picture here, right, is actually how we fundamentally transform the nature of work, how we enable you uh, to do exactly what we do, which is drive a ton of impact and focus on the things that actually matter most. Um, in order to actually drive a systematic adoption of AI, we've built out our workflows platform. We'll talk a little bit about this at the end of our session today, um, but really the workflows platform you can imagine is effectively being a way to take a lot of the things that you're doing in chat, a lot of the things you dream of being able to do with AI, and actually build out a AI process that replicates your best practices and gives you an API to be able to run them at scale. That's right. Any business user can instantly create an API for a problem that they're facing and instantly be able to automate it, which allows hopefully you to do the things that you love about work and maybe uh, automate all the things that you hate. That's enough on uh, the slideware here. Um, we've actually got a couple of guests, actually one uh, very important guest that I want to introduce everyone to. Uh, Anna, do you want to say hi? Hello. I'm more of a nerd behind the scenes, so forgive me if I'm not as webinar ready and smooth as Shakar, but I'm here to help. Anna, you are silky smooth. That was a killer introduction, and I I think it would actually be awesome for the crowd to get a little bit of an understanding of your background. What do you, what do, you do at Copy AI? So I've been working at Copy AI for almost two years now. Um, full-time prompt engineer. I've spent a lot of time with these models. So on the one hand, you know, I, you know, I'm very, I feel very qualified because I've spent so much time just on prompt engineering. And on the other hand, I want to say that I, you know, I come from a copywriting and historical research assistance background. So I actually don't have any STEM background. I don't have a technical background. Um, prompt writing is something that's sort of easy to pick up, easy to pick up, difficult to master, but anyone can master it, so. That is such an empowering uh, statement, Anna, and I really wanna highlight the, the importance of that, right? There's a lot of people that feel like this technology is inaccessible because it is complex or because it has the word machine learning in it, or you don't know what a transformer is. That doesn't matter, right? Our mission is actually to help you get the most out of these platforms. And really what you know Anna has proven to all of us is that, you know, frankly, you can do an incredible job by leveraging your understanding, your technical brain, without necessarily having to have all the context as to, you know, what actually makes these models tick. In fact, if you go talk to a machine learning engineer expert or, really, you know, tweet at one, they'll probably tell you no one really knows how transformer models actually get what they need to get done. So um, that, you know, separate discussion, but let's actually dive into uh, the, the topic for today. So, before we even dive in, there's a lot that you've probably seen in our platform that is really designed for making your life a whole lot easier. If you haven't leveraged our, you know, prop library here, um, what it's really designed to do is, you know, give you a head start. You can, you know, say if you're deciding that you want to create a, you know, social media post like a LinkedIn post, you can simply hit include here and simply plug in the purple text with the detail of the topic that you want it to be about. 
And effectively, this is you know, a great way to go from not knowing anything about what you're doing to actually be able to get an output that you would be proud to you know, actually you know, uh, represent your brand on whatever you know, channel you decided to do, use it on. Um, but you know, there's also a lot of things that we're doing with InfoBase that allow uh, you to be able to not have to reinvent the wheel. You can store key value information here um, as a recently shown files here as well, and use all of this within the chat context in order to be able to do more with less. Now, whereas, whereas a lot of the tooling that we've built out is really designed for you know, uh, making your life a little bit easier, uh, we've still seen that lots of users struggle for, to get the things that they need to get done in chat. Um, they, you know, maybe type something in, get an output, um, iterate on it a little bit, and, you know, they may ultimately land where they want to be, but it, it's a painful process. And again, um, it, it shouldn't, you should enjoy yourself in the process of actually getting these outputs. And, and a lot of it really boils down to the process that you're using to fine tune, um, you know, ultimately the prompts that you're using to get the outputs that you need. For all of those folks that um, you know are following along with us, you might see slightly different outputs. We're actually using a stripped down version of chat that removes some of the complexity that we actually have within our own chat pipeline in order to make it easier for you to demonstrate what a good prompt is, what a bad prompt is. It also helps us show that you know what the raw output might look like so that you can see it in a more consistent and repeatable way. Um, and actually also one more thing, I wanted to thank everyone that as a part of our webinar uh, sign up actually shared the prompts that they were struggling with today. Uh, we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about one in particular. Um, granted, it may not be the most relevant prompt for you, but the goal here, right, is learning. And we'll show you exactly how this applies to other use cases that might be relevant. Uh, but let's actually dive into it, right? Imagine, you know, you are a product marketer that is running a web store of sorts that is going to resell some, you know, incredible things that you might see online. Um, as a FYI, this, you know, isn't the exact prompt. We've modified it a little bit and modified, of course, uh, the, the product itself just for anonymity. An, 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 I don't know, anonymity? Is that, is that the right word, Anna? You're the, okay, cool, anonymity. I think I nailed it. Uh, <laughs> uh, safe, but um, let's actually give this a shot. Here, I'll copy and paste it just for the interest of time. But this is the, you know, variation of the prompt that was submitted to us. Give me a witty product description. There are key features and benefits in the URL below. Make the reader feel engaged. Now, outside looking in, it doesn't seem terrible. Um, in fact, before we even confuse everyone on what product this is, I just thought I'd pull it up. Um, this, incidentally, is actually something my wife is super excited about. If you, um, you know, like bird watching and also like HD pictures of birds and always wondered what birds were in your yard, uh, this is like not a plug for, you know, it's no affiliation with us and Bird Buddy. They've got a killer Kickstarter, but um, actually a super interesting product and, um, you know, also something that we're going to be summarizing a lot today. So I thought I'd at least start by giving you a sense of what's actually on this page. Relatively simple, right? It gives us a little bit of information about the product, tells us what the package includes, gives us a price, um, pretty you know, standard product information page. Um, but what we wanna do is actually create our own variation of this that we can actually use in our online store so that we can you know, effectively resell this product or you know, for whatever reason the user was originally trying to generate a product description, um, you know, generate one. Let's see what happens when we submit here. Well, first thing first, we scan the URL. Um, if you don't know that CopyCheck can do this, just drop URLs in. We'll you know, be actually pretty excellent at being able to take the URL that you've provided, get all the context that you need. It actually is a good call out for what's actually happening behind the scenes, because unlike many other platforms, what we're actually doing is dissecting an individual request into the component uh, pieces or component steps that need to be performed in order to get to the end. Uh, in this case, right, we need to scrape the page, get all the text on the page, throw that in the vector database, come back to um, actually what the hell the user wanted and ultimately, you know, give me a product, a witty product descriptions uh, using the key features and benefits in the URL below. Um, and what we see here is, you know, we got a interesting output. Um, you know, it's a little bit long. It goes into a little bit of detail. Uh, it definitely, you know, does what we would at least hope it did on the baseline of, you know, bringing back um, what is included in the box as well as, you know, using some jokes about like the feather-tastic package, um, which, you know, um, is, I guess, witty uh, enough. Uh, but, you know, I'd be hard pressed to see if this would actually be the kind of product description that, you know, I'd see on a website. Um, it ultimately is something that honestly could be improved a lot. It lacks structure, it overuses emojis, perhaps it's, you know, maybe a little bit too conversational. Um, and most of all, it actually doesn't, you know, accomplish its purpose. It doesn't make me want to, you know, actually use or actually buy this product. So, Anna, let's just dive in. How do we make this better? I can, you know, just basically take this and hit the prompt improve button, right? That's usually how I go about it. 
I mean, the prompt improve button definitely helps. It'll help kind of enrich the prompt and fill it out more, but it can also be really helpful to start from a better place, especially if you want to keep the prompt simple and short. Um, so one thing I'd like to sort of call out here is that there is this listing of features and the features appear a little bit in the body text, but it's not as like integrated into, it, it doesn't do an amazing job of like really taking the features from the website and like using them and sort of imbuing them into the copy in a more organic way. Um, and so one trick I use uh, for exactly this problem, um, there's this category of, of tools that I call causative language. And this is, this is a type that I call integrative language where you kind of link elements together grammatically um, or with words like corresponding or resulting. But here we're gonna say, you know, if we look at the original prompt, it just says there are key features and benefits in the URL below. It's very static and it's very separate from the sort of command line of the prompt, which comes before, give me a witty project description. So we want to like integrate those two things together and we want to be really clear about how they're linked together, not just, you know, like be like, give me a weighted product description, comma, and there are key features and benefits in the URL below. So let's see, if we were going to do that, what if we change it to like use the key features and benefits from the URL below to write a witty product description? And that way, you can see how it's more tightly wound. It's like each part of the sentence leads you on to the next part of the sentence. And it's all very integrated together into almost like one functioning object, one thing. I love that idea. And, you know, honestly, I'd never heard of integrative language before, but the way you're describing it makes a lot of sense. We tend to do this in order to communicate more effectively with each other. And it sounds like, you know, this is also a great strategy that we could potentially use to actually make our props a little bit better. So um, in this case, you know, let's just try it out. Um, everything else about the prompt is the same. All I changed was really the one sentence that Anna had called out and then, you know, called out, make the reader feel engaged. It's gonna think about it for a couple seconds here, but again, we're doing a lot of the same things that we did before. Uh, again, breaking it down with the steps, actually coming back and getting a little bit more detailed in terms of the types of output that um, you know we want to perform, and I think the integrative language component actually allows us to you know ultimately see a product description that is actually a little bit more effective at communicating what the value of this product is or how this product um, you know actually might benefit me, and actually more cleanly incorporate you know effectively the um, various uh, 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 features and benefits that are described on the URL. Yeah, it did a much better job. I mean, there's still the list, but you can see like the the uh, body of the copy, the paragraphs, it's like very integrated into that, um, where it's actually like doing what you told it to do, which is using those to write the product description, rather than those just kind of being next to each other. That's a great call out. And I think, you know, putting our, uh, our lesson together here, um, I think, you know, what we're really describing is finding a way to link all of the various elements of a prompt together, right? And and I, you already touched on causative language, but you know, this is just going in a little bit more detail. Anything else that you would feel like is important for our audience to know? Yeah, I mean, the domino metaphor might sound simplistic, but I think it's helpful to keep in mind where it's like, does each part of the prompt or each part of the sort of command sentence of the prompt lead you forward into the next part? And so, I know this is an example that we covered in our, our prompt school exercise, but uh, you know I think it's important to, to really sum, summarize this in terms of do's and don'ts. Uh, is there a way that you can make this crystal clear? Um, yeah, I would say um, you know be careful not to make things less clear when you're doing this. Don't do this at the expense of clarity. But I think you'll find when you're doing this that it actually like helps you both make things more clear and also almost like creating more, creates more room in the prompts because you're saying things more efficiently. Um, so here are some examples, like, you know, if you were gonna have it complete something, you'd say below is the brief and the piece of content and you wanted to write the piece of content, you might use, you know, vocabulary that implies link, like that those two things are linked together with below is a brief and the resulting content. Or instead of here's the client feedback, 
and, you know, rewrite the post with the sort of just like implication that you expect it to have that, that it will get, um, it will understand the implication, but it's just one step farther for it to have to go rather than you saying something really clear for it, like apply the feedback above to the post. And I want to talk here about something called covert failure, where there are times when the AI like does the task and it's not that it has totally failed or anything, but it does the task in this kind of lackluster way. I call it the tentative student because it's as if you handed, you know, an instruction sheet to a middle schooler that was unclear and they aren't going to come to you for more instructions because they're a middle schooler. So they just kind of do the thing sort of because they're not super clear. So they kind of half ass it and then they just sort of hand it back to you like, I don't know, here you go. And, and those are like some of the results you get when the prompt isn't clear. Yeah. No, I th it's direct inspiration to be clear. But yeah, so this kind of helps avoid some of those. A lot of these steps help avoid that. That's a great call out because I think, you know, in some instances, we may not see the immediate impact of, you know, uh, a small change, but these small changes put together uh, can really drastically improve our output. Um, now, I know uh, there's the causative language is really just one or integrative causative language is just one example. Um, wanted to call out, by the way, if uh, everyone wants to learn a little bit more about different kinds of causative language. And it actually does a great job in our prop school B1, um, actually talking a little bit more about transformative language, which actually helps us do the exact opposite of what we discussed, right? Get a net new prompt. Uh, but again, we uh, can't cover everything on today's session. So trust that one, we're uh, going to continue doing these, but we will come back uh, to a lot of these concepts over and over again. Let's get back to our prompt. Um, so this is pretty good, right? I mean, I think pretty much we've. Uh, Crack the puzzle here. And it's the best product description we could probably ever ask for. Um, and I, you should just ship this, right? Oh, Anna, Oops, you're sorry, on mute. was on mute. Uh, I think there's still room for for improvement here. Um, one thing I want to call out uh, is that we kind of just throw in the URL at the end. We, we do reference it in the prompt, which is good, but then we kind of give it without context, like on faith a little bit, that it'll know that it, that's still the URL we're talking about. So I want to just, you know, definitely put in a label there. Um, let's see. In the so I could just do like URL? Features and benefits. Well, interesting. we want sort of consistency in labeling. Like you want to, if you're working with an element within a prompt, you want to clearly call that element the same thing each time. Um, should, like you don't want to call, call, call the recipient of an email like recipient and uh, not that because it'll that's sort of a duplication of what we're trying to do here. If you're like write a product description and then you're like product description, it'll be like, OK, so there's already a product description. What am I doing? And it, again, it probably won't fail, but it'll be that kind of covert failure. So let's call it key features and benefits, maybe, because we already call it that in, in the first uh, part of the prompt. I see. So in this case. We're telling it to use the key features and benefits. So this is already language that we've decided on. Obviously, we could have said a number of other things, but in this case, we called it key features and benefits. So it's helpful to call it key features and benefits here just to refer to the thing that we wanted it to refer to. Is that, am I understanding that exactly, correctly? Exactly, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, if you can really map things out for it, that's very helpful. And you know, while we're waiting on that to come back, um, I think it's also important to come back to why this is important in uh, the first place, um, but also call out exactly the covert failure point that Anna made a second ago. We may not see you know, a change on a one-to-one -one basis. In fact, nine out of 10, dropping the URL might work you know, decently well. Um, but what we also know is that a problem with covert failure is also the fact that sometimes it just doesn't want to work that 10th time. And, you know, for a use case of product descriptions, you're going to do this, you know, hundreds of thousands of times potentially. It's really important to focus on, you know, everything that you can do to get the best output possible. And so, Anna, I think you're really just referring to how we can be consistent with our labeling. Um, could you speak a little bit more as to, you know, how we can use labeling and when we should, you know, use synonyms versus not synonyms? Like what, what words are even best if there is a, a specific word we should use? Yeah, so synonyms are really important in general, but this is one area where you don't want to use them. In normal writing, part of what makes good writing flow is not repeating the same word many times. 
but in a prompt, generally you, you want your prompts to sound like good writing, but this is one way where you break that rule. Where, like I said, like if you're writing an email, you wouldn't want to refer uh, to the, you wouldn't want to like refer to the person receiving that email as the recipient. And then later be like prospect brief and just sort of expect it to link those two things together um, in a really clear way. Again, it, it will, but it'll have to like take that extra step that just makes it like a little farther from the task to begin with. And you want to just like set everything up for it so that it has all the tools it needs in a really clearly labeled way. And it, it doesn't have to make those leaps that you can make for it. It can just kind of get to the task. Um, so here we have an example of, uh, you know, not wanting to to uh, refer to the same thing in two different ways. But on the right, uh, something that actually came up with the prompt we're working on now, where you're like, can we call it product description? Um, you don't want to duplicate labels either. You don't want to have a prompt where you ask it to write a, prompt, a job description. And within that, have a section where you describe the job and you call it job description. Maybe you'd want to change that to like job details, for instance. That is fascinating. And, you know, I think back to like myself in middle school, if someone gave me an assignment that had, you know, confusing labels, um, you know, I think I would tell myself I probably was spending all of my time growing and adjusting, but, you know, fun reality is I'm actually not that tall. So I certainly wasn't that used that time to grow, uh, but I was extremely lazy, right? Um, that is the reality of, uh, not to say that, you know, uh, a large language models are lazy, but uh, there's a lot that you can do to help them actually do the right thing um, and actually follow your intents. Um, because keep in mind, these things have been trained on the entire corpus of, you know, massive volumes of text. So being able to use the right word and be discreet and clear is a critical aspect of actually getting what you want because you're actually forcing them to recall the right things that they need in order to be able to accomplish your task. Um, let's get let's get back to our prompt though, right? I think we should probably have gotten the result back. Um, and you know, frankly, this looks pretty similar to what we've seen before. Um, but again, nine out of 10 is not good enough. We want 10 out of 10. And so uh, a lot of these best practices you, uh, you know, should leverage and will really help you get the most um, out of especially things that you're saving for your team to be able to reuse. Uh, by the way, if you don't know how to do that, you can uh, literally use our prop library. So you don't know where the, oh, oops, I'm looking at it up. But yeah, you can literally hit save prompt here and we make it really, really easy for you to be able to generate a uh, prompt that the rest of your team is able to leverage, uh, at least as long as they're in the same workspace. Okay, so I'm gonna just assume that we're not done yet, Anna. You seem like a little bit of a perfectionist and uh, you know, I try to you know, do my best here. Uh, what's, our, what's our next task at hand? So there's something kind of hanging off the end of the, the first line of the prompt, which is make the reader feel engaged, which, you know, first of all, it's not, we haven't integrated it into the main sort of sentence, main command line of the prompt, which is its own thing, but also even just the phrasing of it um, to begin with, we're kind of circling around to the real verb that we mean. The main verb of that sentence is make, which is like kind of generic or make the reader feel if you want to give the full verb phrase. Um, so one way we can make that a lot more powerful is we can take that verb that we actually mean, which is engaged, and we can just make it the main verb and say, engage the reader. And we can integrate it into the original sentence and just say, that engages the reader. Or we can just write. So like that, the right? Just, all caps, if I yell, it'll do it. <laughs> Perfect. Yes, all caps will make your prompt. No, it won't. Um, so we want to, at the end of that sentence, um, do something like that engages the reader. And not only have we hooked it into the, that sentence, but we've centered our purpose in the verb. So here we're doing that like sort of later in the verb I, or later in the prompt. I want to come back to this where it's sort of the central way we change the prompt, but I think this is good for this one. That's amazing. And so, you know, effectively what we've done is actually just make it actually a core part of the prompt that we were trying to write in the first place, right? We um, mm -hmm. sound like an afterthought in the initial example. And in this case, you know, we're getting actually something that looks, again, a lot more engaging. Um, you know, I'm not sure 
And I'm sure, you know, all the technical folks in the room are just trying to figure out, okay, like, is there a control flow? Is there some sort of like order of operations? Is it going to do the first sentence and the second sentence? Um, there's not really that, right? We can't really introspect these models and predict how they're going to respond in a given circumstance. Um, but, you know, really understanding how we can use language to get what we want is a key aspect of this. And again, you know, we're still, um, I would actually even argue that having this list of things that come with the package is probably something you want ultimately somewhere on your product description. Um, but again, we want to make something that's very engaging and actually something that is going to um, engage the reader. And I think, you know, at least in this iteration, we've gotten a little bit closer to that. Um, and yeah, I would actually call out that this one is more focused on the reader themselves rather than the birds. Like, I mean, maybe you want that, maybe you don't, but clearly the person who wrote this originally does want that with, you know, make the reader feel engaged, where it's like, let's turn you into the ultimate bird aficionado. And there's a lot more of that type of thing in there. I really like the way that you frame that. It's about the reader, not the bird. And I mean, let's be honest, the solar powered, uh, sorry, the solar birdhouse with a camera in it, maybe it, about 80 So you can brag to your friends you. about the birds you've seen. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, well, my wife's mom actually bought this off of Kickstarter. We get pictures of cool birds that are in her yard all the time. Anyways, I'll stop selling this product. I swear there's no affiliation. I just bought one. So maybe you like birds too and want to see what birds are coming to your yard. Uh, but Shikar puts in his two-week notice and leaves us for bird buddy. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually building an AI bird model that is going to help people understand. Um, actually, this product already does that. Damn, it really cornered the market. But yeah, yeah. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about the, the, the principle here, right? Um, what we've yeah. done is unleash the power of the verb here um, by actually kind of integrating it with the rest of the language. Um, can you give us a few more examples here, Anna? I mean, here are some examples. So um, you uh, want to, like I said, sort of put the main purpose, the like essence of what you're trying to do in the verb itself. So instead of rewrite this to be shorter, where the verb is rewrite, you say condense this, where you've like imbued that verb with your end goal. Um, or instead of like give, give more, give more what information and details. Okay. Like it's sort of these steps, right? Rather than like, starting with elaborate on this and it's like immediately in the task or um you know write an interesting hook where hook is like it's it's like this long contraption that ends with hook no what we want is to be in the task itself rather than have the task be secondary with like write something that's an interesting hook we want to like hook the reader so we're sort of we've positioned ourselves like in the purpose of the prompt, rather than that being sort of secondary to these generic, you know, command verbs that are like give, write, you know, uh, tell me that, you know, that kind of thing. So that actually brings up a good point. Um, and I'd, I'd love to just get your perspective on this. Um, I, we saw a second ago that, you know, potentially, you know, the language actually matters a lot. Um, so what's your take on the verb itself? Like, should I try to find fancy ones? Should I try to find simple ones? Is there, is there some like magic verb list that you've got behind the scenes, Anna? There, I wouldn't say that uh, a verb that's like fancier is inherently better. Like there's nothing about the fanciness itself that's gonna help you. Um, <laughs> but like the, it's kind of the like richness of the verb in terms of its meaning. Um, I would say like the more generic the verb, I mean, there, there are instances where you would want that, but in general, the more specific the verb, the better, the less generic, the better. And sometimes that does translate to these kinds of like, if you want to say like fancier verbs, because it's like you're digging deeper in your vocabulary is what I'd say. I like that a lot. And I, I think, you know, a lot of us may not have necessarily all of the, the know-how, the, the fancy verbs, but we do know how we want to communicate things. Are there any tips you have for like, you know, if I just had a verb in mind, how I can get variations of it? Yeah, I would um, say you can, you know, use these tools natively. So you can even go into our chat and just be like, what are other ways of phrasing this? Or what are some synonyms for this? Or you could even maybe give it like one of those sentences, like, you know, give more information and details about this and be like, rephrase this as a single verb or a single verb phrase or like that kind of thing. Um, rephrase this to be more active. Um, but yeah, even just going into chat and being like, give me other ways to say this, give me synonyms is a great start. 
That is a great idea. I'd actually never even thought about just, you know, getting synonyms um, instead of looking up the source, just asking chat. Uh, but, you know, you actually do bring up a good point as it relates to, to synonyms. Um, I want to say there might be some value in that. Like, you know, um, if we look back at this prompt, is there any other uh, thing that you would you'd change about it? Like, you know, I keep looking at this word witty. Um, it's witty. Same, yeah. Um, what, what are your thoughts, Anna? Exactly, yeah, like, we, we've been getting these results that are very like, I would say sort of on the playful side um, and more on the like whimsical side. And that's what witty means for a lot of people. Maybe you want to lean into that and be like, you know, a whimsical comma witty product description or a playful product description. But maybe that's not what you mean by witty. Maybe you mean like more everyday or like kind of like a refined sense of humor or whatever, like droll would be, I think the right word um, for that. Or maybe you mean facetious, like a little sharper, a little more like, you know, um, I guess, well, facetious is kind of a mean way to take your product <laughs> description. So you probably don't want that. Um, but yeah, I think like, there's like a scale of like, erudite to like whimsical here. And so part of the, the thing with synonyms is you can always like, when you're rephrasing things, you're doing it for two reasons. The first is that time that it, it like unlocks what the AI can do. Like if you have a prompt and you're not sure if the AI can do it and it's just not doing it, sometimes just like different phrasing, different words, different synonyms, even piling on synonyms can really help. But you're also doing it to like figure out what you mean. You know what I mean? Like as you hit the hail, hit the hail on the net, hit the nail on the head more. Oh my God. Hit the nail on the head more with your, with like how you phrase your prompt. Like it'll hit the, oh my God, I have to say it again. It'll nail on the hit net. the we nail on the we head more <laughs> with its output. Um, but yeah, like as you really narrow it on what you mean, it'll narrow it on what you want along with you. And so that's kind of part of the fun of like searching for synonyms for me personally, is you're like, oh, yes, that's exactly what I mean. And you get to put that in there. So uh, we've got a lot of options here. Um, I thought, you know, whimsical is one that was on your mind. It also is on the screen here in case everyone wants to know what any of these words mean. I actually genuinely had to look up erudite because I hadn't thought about that word in a little while. Um, probably brush up on my SAT vocabulary a bit. Um, wh which one do you think feels right, Anna, based on the intent of the original prompt? Um, let's see. I think, so I think maybe this was going more for, for like originally for like whimsical or playful, but I think we've been seeing a lot of that already. So I'm going to say, um, droll and clever. You want to use both? You use droll yeah. and clever? Droll let's let's emphasize clever? it with both. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. So why why use both? I mean, often you mean something that's located somewhere between the meanings of two words, and that's okay. Like just use both words. But also it can all it can help the AI when you like emphasize something that way. Um, I mentioned sort of piling on synonyms, um, and that could be really helpful. That's a that's a great call out. And I think, you know, we've actually gotten something that looks a little bit more curious in an unusual way that promotes dry amusement. Uh, glad we had that on the screen because I would have I would have struggled defining that uh, precisely. Um, but, you know, I think it's actually super interesting, though, that really a lot of what we've done here is really iterate on the same sentence for now 40 minutes now. And um, mm -hmm. Awesome to see that you know everyone's sticking around to see that the the why this is so important. Um, I know you know we've probably seen a I bunch of other. Do you want to? Sorry to interrupt you. I do want to call out quickly that it used droll several times throughout this, which is probably not what we want. That can happen when the word is a little too unusual. So that would be a hint to us to actually find another synonym for droll. But we don't have to do that at this point. I just wanted to give one one more squeeze one more tip in there. Anyway, sorry. No, that's that's a great that's a great trip. That's a great tip. Um, so in this case, let's see if you know adding witty back um, might give us something a little bit more uh, witty and clever as opposed to okay, it's just uh, being a little bit redundant. 
Again, um, we've stripped out some of the other things that we've added to our chat. So you may mm. have gotten a different result if you tried this um, yourself. We've basically turned the creativity massively down on our own yeah, models to yeah. hopefully give you that. That's why uh, it's using more phrases like, but that's not all that you kind of wouldn't normally find that in its generations. Um, but like Jakar is saying, we turned the creativity down in order to show you very concretely what we're talking about and also not rely on like, oh, it just, ha this one just happened to be better than the last one. Like we're showing you in a more like deterministic way. Like this is sort of the baseline, but because it's the baseline, it's the quality is maybe not quite as good as you would find with the creativity turned up. 100%. And I think that, you know, this really comes to the heart of what it means to be a really effective prompt engineer, right? We already talked about taking advantage of synonyms. Hopefully that makes everything clear. But what I was getting at is, this is really what we've done, right? Anna, like how many times do you rewrite a typical prompt? How much time do you spend on the same couple of sentences? Oh God, I don't want to think about it. When I'm rewriting a prompt, I save maybe, I save every little change and I save like, sometimes like a hundred versions of it. You don't have to do that much. But like, my point is, you know, and Jagar's point is that if you have a cool idea for something you wanted to do or, even like a cool strategy for how you want it to do that, don't give up after the first try because often you just need to speak to it in the right way. And rewriting, I mean, writing is rewriting. That's sort of a mantra of writers, but prompt writing is also rewriting. And you know, you can really massively improve your output by kind of finessing these things. That is such an important takeaway because I know a lot of us have banged our heads against our keyboards after we tried something. We're like, yeah, this language model just can't do it. It's not possible. You know, um, for whatever reason, it can solve world hunger, but can't write me a product description. Uh, probably not the right approach, right? We should actually try to work with it and see, you know, how we can actually leverage, um, you know, our understanding of it to get the output that we actually want. And here's, yeah. here's actually the best part, right? Um, there's a lot of tricks that you've actually probably learned or at least heard about or have seen other people employ. Um, we've actually leveraged none of them so far. We've All we've done is you know, effectively uh, focus primarily on the original prompt that we had had. Uh, in fact, let me actually scroll up just so you can do a left or right here. Give me a witty product description. There are key features and benefits in the URL below make the reader feel engaged versus use the key features and benefits in the URL below to write a witty, clever product description that engages the reader, key features and benefits practically almost the same words, yet drastically different outputs. And what this means is that, you know, say ultimately what we're seeing in this product description is it's actually not giving us, say, the structure that we want. You know, we have a specific product page that we're trying to populate and specific placeholders that we need to fill. Well, the beauty of it is we can actually add um, all of that information back in. So in this case, you know, we want a tagline, we want an overview, we want some key features. And uh, we want a summary of what's included. Uh, we can simply specify that and call it out as a you know output that we're expecting. And simply by doing that, um, we'll actually get something a little bit closer to the outputs that we were looking for. And you know, whereas this has been you know really an exercise around writing a great product description, uh, there's a lot that you can do with Copy AI that will uh, really leverage these capabilities in order to help you improve everything that you're trying to do. Um, for example, I know a use case that comes up for users all the time is how can we actually extract the right information out of, say, a PDF or a file that we've uploaded to the Infobase? By the way, if you didn't know you could do that, um, you can you know, literally go to Infobase and upload a file. I'm just going to have it stop writing there, but hopefully everyone got a sense for you know what taglines and key features could actually look like. This is a great way to really get the outputs that you wanted. Um, in fact, um, actually, before I even get to that, let's actually try that one more time here, um, because I think there was something pretty important that um, is, is is missing. You know, to really wrap a bow around the product descriptions example here, and uh, you know, I'm not even gonna. Uh, expand this out a whole lot, but we'll see what the output comes back as. What we might find is that, you know, even after we get the output that we want, it's not quite written in the voice that we want to actually, um, you know, leverage or what best represents our brand. Uh, we hear this all the time, and this is actually a huge area of focus uh, for us. And let's just say you should expect uh, some of these capabilities in the UI very, very soon. Um, but, you know, after we ultimately get a great baseline product description, what we can actually do is leverage the power of Infobase to, you know, for example, extract 
the brand voice from either a brand we love, a brand that represents the voice that we're trying to write in, or other content that we've created, and then simply chain it. So one other step in order to actually completely transform the outputs. So let's actually try that. I can say, you know, could you re rewrite this with uh, BB Four Seasons? And you might be wondering why I'm using the Four Seasons. What bird does not want to stay at the Four Seasons? I mean, I want to stay at the Four Seasons. This is ultimately the brand voice of Bird Buddy. And so we want to make it really, really clear that this is actually written from the perspective of this brand. A refined encounter with nature's, of, of nature's winged wonders. The Bird Buddy with Solar Road invites you to indulge in enchanting bird, bird watching, elevated by modern sophistication. I mean, this completely changed the output that we were looking for. And so, you know, there's really a story here, right? We've focused on getting the basics right. We've added to the basics, the structure that we wanted, and then we've actually chained it with another step in order to actually completely transform the writing based on a output that we were actually trying to derive. Now, I know I mentioned I was gonna get into, um, actually, I could do something similar with files, happy to cover that at a later point in time. The bigger picture here though, right, is actually the process that we've used to get to the output. Right? There's so much that we do in order to get the best baseline possible, to get the best structure possible. But even if we had the best prompt on the planet, in some instances, it just requires more steps than that. In fact, I'd actually even take a step back and someone hired me and said it was my job to like, you know, basically save this prompt and run it over and over and over again to generate thousands of product descriptions. Um, I don't know how happy I'd be. It doesn't sound super fulfilling and you know, probably would spend a lot of my time basically chatting with a bot. And while I'm happy to do that to improve my prompt, um, you know, probably a painful thing to do in perpetuity. And that's really where our workflows platform comes in. Um, what workflows is designed to do is actually take really the process that we've performed in chat, the idea of, you know, actually finding the perfect prompt and being able to run it over and over and over again on a series of data and give you the ability to actually generate an API for it. In fact, within our workflows platform, there's a product description from example prompt uh, that can actually do a really good job at leveraging a existing example of a product description as well as a product brief in order to be able to instantly give you the ability to generate not one, not two, but literally an entire CSV or an entire API calls worth uh, at a single point in time. I'll do a quick walkthrough of really what I mean by this, um, but you know, trust that if we had you know, just product information here, we could actually use it with, along with an example in order to generate, you know, the product description that we need to get out of the other end. Now, this is just one example of a workflow. There's lots and lots of workflows. In fact, there's probably a workflow for most of the things that you're trying to do repeatedly at scale. Uh, and if there's not one yet, uh, we're excited to share with you in a couple of weeks exactly how you can be the first person to make the workflow that helps you hate or automate what you hate. But the best part about even templated workflows is that we actually give you the ability to actually completely customize all of the attributes of it Every single workflow has an API already. So if you don't want to log into our product and you know you want to break our front engineer's parts, um, no, just kidding, they, they won't actually care. Um, we want you to be able to integrate this with your product information. And uh, we want to be able to integrate this with really any system that you have in mind. And so when you think about really the power of workflows, you should really think about the power of what you're doing today in chat, right? If you're able to iterate on something and get what you want, especially by leveraging the tips that you know Anna has called out today, I think there's a ton that you can do once you've perfected in order to one, be able to do the same thing over and over again, but two, help your team actually continue to do that without actually having to think about it. Anymore. And that's where there's a huge difference, right? That's what I mean when I think about going from being able to be 20, 50 or 100% better at my job, 100% faster at my job to fundamentally, fundamentally removing it from a thing that I need to actually do every single week. Um, Rob coined this last week, I believe, but you know the idea of white collar assembly line work uh, is definitely a real thing. And too many of us spend way too much of our lives being trapped in doing the same thing over and over and over again. And what workflows actually allows you to do is get out of the button clicking business and get into remembering why you love your job in the first place and actually doing the things that matter to you most. Uh, now we've got 10 minutes here. Wanted to see first, um, actually, Justin, Garrett, Rob, are there any other questions in the chat or that have come up throughout this session that it would be important for Anna to be able to cover? There's been some questions around uh, like brand voice and kind of the best way to include that in a prompt. 
Um, I know that there are some folks that were saying that they were actually getting some of the uh, the inputs from the brand voice as part of the output. Um, so, like Anna, maybe this would be a good question for you. I know you mentioned labeling earlier. Um, would it be important to like call that out and label that correctly, or how would you suggest doing that? I guess. Yeah, I would. Um, rather than just saying like, if if say you have it saved in Infobase, rather than uh, just saying using and then tagging the brand voice, I would really, really label it with like uh, in the following type of voice or using the following brand voice, Nicole in, um, and just, or, or keeping it separate from the main part and just, you know, being like execute the above using the following brand voice, um, just being really clear to the AI about what it is rather than just kind of, you know, throwing it in there. Um, yeah, that, that should, it might not, you know, fits at a hundred percent, but that should Im improve the success rate. Have you I mean, seen well, any difference in saying like using the like calling out the brand voice and say use the above brand voice versus use the following brand voice? Does that make any difference at all? Um, I haven't noticed a, a huge difference in that. Um, if there's if your brand voice's description is pretty long, I tend to like to end the prompts with uh like the the main task um so if you have a long brand voice what i would brand voice description what i would do is sort of introduce the task at the beginning of the prompt label the brand voice and you know it's like use this brand voice for this task whatever um and then reiterate at the bottom what the task is or you know have that be your main prompt is, is at the bottom would, would be my suggestion I think one other call out here is that we know and hear that there is a lot of opportunity for you to be able to leverage all of the brand voices that you have in mind. Um, as I've mentioned, I know uh, it's not quite out yet, but expect an update in our platform very soon. And uh, I hope that it will make everyone's life a whole lot easier in terms of being able to not have to reinvent the wheel when they're thinking about how they can, you know, say, for example, um, use the appropriate brand voice. Yeah, we'll, we'll take care of this soon for you where where brand voice fits in so would love to any other any other questions sorry rob and uh justin maybe talk through prompt chaining a little bit more i noticed that you kind of have like an example hovered up here where first you asked it to create the description using a really good prompt and then now you're asking it to to rewrite using um, the following yeah, brand so, voice. so there are certain things where it makes sense to have it sort of be all together in the initial task at once but then there are certain things where you know if you're asking it to do many things at once simultaneously to one thing sometimes it can lose one aspect or you know struggle or find two things at odds with each other and in that case it can be really helpful to just do it in two steps where you say have it generate a product description and maybe you have a really complicated structure for that and there are a lot of like other requirements for that and so you have it you know generate that but you also want it to be in this really specific brand voice to use that example and it's just having trouble doing all of that at once so maybe you have it generate that in that specific structure and then you go, okay, great. Now rewrite this in XYZ brand voice. Um, and, you know, there's, there's no shame in splitting things up. I do it all the time. Um, and that can be really helpful for when you're just trying to like do these multifaceted tasks all at once. That's a great call out, Anna. And I think, you know, to the end of, it really depends on what you're trying to do and what the right order of operations is. Another kind of tell is, is the output of one task actually extremely relevant for another task. So for example, scraping a website and having exactly the right information that you're actually going to want to use, say from, you know, a file that you have in Infobase or a website on the internet. Um, you know, those are ultimately tasks that are very different. So if you were to scrape something and, you know, give yourself like 
the overall you know structure of something you wanted to do something with. And then the other thing you want to do was like write a LinkedIn post, right? You could probably do a LinkedIn post, a Twitter post, an Instagram post, perhaps in like one go, but I would be um, much, much more, uh, you know, and as our, our lead engineer is saying, that's probably not a really good idea, but you know, that's actually the, 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 the important thing to think about, right? Like just what, what are the inputs and what are the outputs and what is the appropriate steps they're actually running in? And yeah, in general, I, I would recommend one task at a time and it can be a, a complex nuanced task, but kind of, yeah, one, one task at a time. And it's capable kind of, of more if you needed to do more, but if, if you're struggling with the quality, breaking it down into the separate tasks for sure. That's a great call out. There actually is um, one other question that I just saw in the Q&A that I'd love to get your perspective on. Um, how important it is, is it from a CEO's perspective to encourage prompt engineering within the organization? How would you tackle the problem of upskilling? How would I tackle the problem of? Upskilling. Uh, so oh, helping upskilling. everyone else become a better prompt engineer. Like, is that is that relevant? Is that important? Do you believe in it? And if you were a CEO, how would, how would you go about it? Yeah, I think so. I mean, if, if you uh, have an operation where, you know, your employees are uh, writing inputs, like it's the, the quality of their work, the quality of the outputs is going to be really dependent on the quality of the inputs. So, you know, you could teach basic sort of prompt engineering tips, especially for sort of more straightforward, like command style prompts. Um, uh, I would say enforcing uh, grammatical like consistency and and you know good grammar, good spelling, that kind of thing. Um, if you if you put in you know bad grammar and, and bad spelling, you won't get bad grammar and bad spelling out. But it will sort of affect the overall just vibe of the output you get sometimes. Um, so that would be one thing I'd suggest. Um, and then obviously you know uh, personalized for your company for whatever you do, um, if there are specific uh, tasks that, or elements of tasks that the employees need to use over and over again in their inputs, I would find good, effective, like really spot on ways of phrasing those and encourage employees to like reuse those phrasings rather than coming up with their own every time. And that actually is one of the main uh, reasons why we've actually invested so much time and effort in making this process as easy for your teams as possible. Infobase, um, you know, of course, allows you to save files, but also allows you to save things like mission statements, things like founder statements, things like, you know, uh, basically top level product uh, marketing copy that you might be using to describe, you know, what the product actually is that someone spent a lot of time and effort on. Um, beyond that, um, as I've mentioned before, it's very, very easy to be able to save your own pumps. Um, in fact, here's uh, you know a handful that we've uh, saved for ourselves. The case study analysis that we wanted to do or wanted to call out uh, is something that we've actually got a save prompt here for. Of course, you might start with something like could you just you know summarize the case study. Um, but in order to help your users, you know, not have to reinvent the wheel, even in the chat context, um, you can you know write these prompts for them and help them use prompt library to be able to provide the right URL or the right um, you know info base entry to be able to refer back to it and ultimately make everyone's life that much easier. Um, I know we're at the tip of time here. Thank you for spending this whole hour with us. And I hope that you know, you've actually gained 10X the, or 100X the benefit in your own ability to get chat to do what you need. And um, you know, we're really excited to continue growing and raising the water level for everyone um, on how they can actually get what they need out of these models and out of our platform so that they can actually do more of what they love doing. Um, if you uh, enjoyed this, um, shameless plug for checking out uh, Anna's Prop School video. It goes into even more detail as to how you can actually leverage these capabilities. Uh, if you're hungry for more, know that we've got a lot of other lessons to share, and we're really excited to continue helping you up level in your own AI native journey. Um, with that, I guess I think you have maybe 15 seconds that I'll give you back. Um, but thank you. Thank you all for joining us again. See you next week. Actually, no, see you the week after. Sorry, we're, we're going to offside next week. So we'll see you next week. Later. Bye, everybody.